One day, my mother-in-law sternly criticized me. Are you just playing on the computer instead of doing housework? I was baffled and irritated by this. At the time, I was focused on an important remote work task, but my mother-in-law completely failed to understand this. Unaware of the situation, she suddenly threw tea in my face. As a result, I was soaking wet, and she had a satisfied look on my face. I felt intense anger inside. I will show you the new way of being a housewife. Be prepared. My name is Emily, and I am 30 years old, fortunately having a smooth pregnancy. I'm not suffering much from morning sickness and actively learning about homemade baby food. I married Sean, an IT worker, at 25. Considering financial stability for future childcare, we chose to work together, with well-paying jobs and good employment conditions. However, raised as a pampered daughter, my mother-in-law believed that women should stay home and have children. This mindset was inherited from her parents, and her mother-in-law, having no working experience, was unable to change this way of thinking. My late father-in-law had promised her parents when marrying her that he would never let their daughter work or suffer hardship. This promise seemed to have greatly influenced her way of thinking, to the point where she openly expressed outdated views like a husband with a working wife is incompetent. The fact that I wanted to continue working after marriage was something she couldn't accept. I always faced harsh words from her for choosing to work post-marriage. She had never imagined a woman would want to continue working after getting married and assumed I would become a homemaker. At our wedding, there was no mention of such ideas, and my husband Sean seemed unaware that his mother thought this way. Sean's family background was not one of a domineering father but rather a relatively affluent and peaceful one, and he never really felt any discomfort with his parents' old-fashioned views. Although having a stay-at-home mom wasn't unusual, it's ironic that our marriage made him aware of his family's conservative views. Then one day, when my mother-in-law tried to visit us unexpectedly, she found no one at home. We were both out working that day, and she waited until evening, to explode in anger seeing me return in my work suit. I wasn't told that you would be out of the house. I endured a two-hour-long lecture from her. What we decide as a couple is our business, so please refrain from unnecessary comments. That's unacceptable. It would make people think you're incompetent. My mother-in-law's outdated views continually perplexed her son. However, for our dream of owning a house with a garden, we decided to follow our path, undeterred by her opinions, and firmly resolved to continue working together. Suddenly, the global pandemic of COVID-19 began casting a shadow over our lives. At the worst possible time, my mother-in-law suffered a fractured wrist, an unfortunate incident. We heard from my brother-in-law that she felt uneasy being alone with her injury and wished to stay with him. However, as my brother-in-law was already married, he rejected her request. He cited reasons like living out of state and needing to avoid contact, being worried about the infection risk, and repeatedly using COVID-19 as an excuse to deny her requests to live together. In reality, her injury wasn't so severe, and she could have managed living alone. Nevertheless, she persistently pressured my brother-in-law, exaggerating her situation to the point of claiming she couldn't live alone at all. As a result, my brother-in-law suggested that she stay with us until she fully recovered, effectively pushing the responsibility onto us. Unfortunately, our house was relatively close to her house, making this arrangement feasible. Living near her, we didn't need to move to another state like my brother-in-law, which meant the convenient COVID-19 excuse didn't hold much weight for us. Despite our attempts to decline, we eventually had to accept her for a short period, due to my brother-in-law's insistence. This half-hearted solution came about because of my mother-in-law's persistent desire to live with him. She repeatedly claimed she couldn't live alone, so she found herself with no alternative but to accept a temporary stay at our place. Consequently, a difficult situation began, all living together benefiting no one. After a long day of overtime work, I returned home exhausted, only to be confronted by her waiting at the entrance. Emily, where have you been until this late? Shouldn't a wife prioritize her home first? She sternly criticized me. Still exhausted from work, I returned home to the sound of my mother-in-law's dissatisfaction and with a wry smile on my face, I said. 
Actually, today some colleagues suddenly fell ill, and I had to cover for them with overtime. I'll take care of everything at home over the weekend, so don't worry. Weekend? Your main job is being a housewife. Why don't you do housework every day? Do you enjoy being outside that much? I'm sorry. In my heart, there was no feeling of apology towards her. No matter how strongly I asserted that I was not just playing around but seriously working, those words never seemed to reach her. More importantly, I needed to hurry up with dinner preparations for my husband who would be home soon. But as I started preparing dinner in the kitchen, her continuous nagging echoed in my ears. Listen carefully. No matter how much a woman works outside, a woman can never replace a man. Working late is like doing a night job. You should stop such indecent behavior immediately. Your true role is to support your husband properly. That's true happiness for a woman. How long will you keep playing at work? It doesn't even bring in much income. Stop wasting time and focus on having children. Time is stealing away your value as a woman. Listen. In the past, having many children was considered a good thing, but in your case, it's not. While peeling onions, I continued to intentionally ignore her words. However, I was gradually becoming irritated by her harsh words. I'm really sorry. I said, offering only a superficial apology while resisting the urge to throw the freshly peeled onions at her. If you're sorry, you should quit your job. Inside, I sighed deeply, tired of the endless lectures about how a woman should behave. This was becoming a mental burden, even more exhausting than my work. When my husband returned home, her nagging stopped temporarily, but she then uttered something unexpected. I find living in this house very comfortable. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad to stay here permanently. I felt anxiety and fear at this statement. It seemed she realized that she no longer had a place at my brother-in-law's home, and she was expecting grandchildren from us. It made sense why she kept insisting on me to quit the job and have children. Sean and I had made excuses like your own home is best or our house is too small to avoid living with her, but this refusal on our part seemed to have strengthened her resolve. Returning home tired from work, I was surprisingly greeted with a smile by her. Normally, a greeting from her meant a lecture, and a smile only appeared when there was some ulterior motive. Entering the living room, I saw a shocking sight all my work documents that had been on the shelf were gone. Where did the documents that were here go? I asked in a panic. I threw them away. And I cleaned out the fridge, too," replied my mother-in-law calmly. Seeing she continued the conversation without any guilt, I had a bad feeling and hurried to the kitchen where she opened the freezer. Unfortunately, all the frozen food I had used for lunch was gone. Shocked and outraged, I raised my voice. Why would you waste like this? Fortunately, there was a backup of the lost work documents at my company, but my anger over the discarded frozen food, which I had bought in bulk to save money, was unabated. Your job is to be a housewife. Making half-hearted lunches is outrageous. She said coldly. I shot back. Why do you say such things when you're not even the one eating them? I have to keep an eye on what happens in this house. I asserted more strongly. This isn't your house. I retorted boldly. Am I such a nuisance? Although I was merely stating the fact, she covered her face and began to cry, saying, Why are you so cold? I'm just worried about you. However, I noticed her smirking while her face was covered and realized the tears were just a performance. When I thought, she's pretending to cry, I realized my husband's work tools on the same shelf were untouched, I thought this was clearly harassment towards me. Perhaps she was trying to manipulate me into quitting my job and having children, but such actions only intensified my aversion to living with her. The continual small annoyances from her only added to my frustration. I hung out the bedding, but for some reason, Emily's was the only one not dry. She said, having intentionally left my sheets completely wet. I was vacuuming the floor and accidentally sicked up your necklace. 
Oddly, my necklace usually kept on a shelf was found in the vacuum cleaner along with a bunch of hair. I was frustrated, so I sarcastically suggested. Since you're injured, why don't you rest a bit more? This is part of my rehabilitation. My mother-in-law replied nonchalantly. Inside, I thought. Maybe a full body cast would help. Meanwhile, Sean was self-isolating in a hotel due to close contact with a COVID-19 case, not wanting to bring the virus home. Unable to discuss her with him who was already stressed about potentially being infected, I chose to endure silently. As my workplace shifted to remote work, I set up a room for meetings, opening my laptop to start work. You're at home, so do your duty as a wife. You're playing on the computer instead of doing housework. She accused and threw tea in my face. Although the tea wasn't hot, it was a lot because I was saving it to drink later. That tea quickly drenched the surrounding area. Have you reflected a bit? The mother-in-law asked. Feeling deep irritation inside at her irrational behavior, I firmly asserted my position. I am not playing around. I am participating in a meeting remotely. Didn't I explain about this work-from-home situation to you yesterday? The mother-in-law replied sullenly. Don't lie. What are you doing all day cooped up in the room? Can't you at least vacuum a little? Angered by her lack of understanding, I exclaimed. Enough. If you won't listen to me, please leave. I want to focus on my work. However, she persisted relentlessly. No, you must apologize to me. I will not be silent until you do. This is an important process to make you a proper daughter-in-law. I will not forgive you until you apologize. I wondered internally. Was making a daughter-in-law apologize truly the behavior of a respectable mother-in-law? If a boss did the same thing to an employee in the workplace, it would be a significant issue in modern times. However, perhaps the person with no experience working outside couldn't understand such social norms. With my headphones off, I could no longer hear the meeting and felt at a loss about what to do next. Eventually, I had no choice but to apologize. I am truly sorry. I apologize deeply. She pointed at the tea-stained mats and said, Clean this up properly. And she left the room with a satisfied look. I put my headphones back on to return to the meeting, but there was no sound, and it seemed my voice wasn't reaching the others. I also noticed that some colors on the screen were off. I tried to type on my keyboard several times, but it didn't work. It seemed that the keyboard had malfunctioned due to the spilled tea. In this worst-case scenario, I had no choice but to call the other members of the meeting directly, explaining that I had to leave due to technical issues. That night, after a three-week stay in a hotel, Sean finally returned home. As soon as he stepped into the house, he seemed to have something important to tell his mother. Mom, I need to talk to you. Sean said sternly. Surprised, she responded. Huh. Sean continued with a serious demeanor. Mom, I saw everything today, how you threw it in Emily's face. My mother-in-law's expression changed dramatically from a smile to shock. What are you talking about? She asked, confused. Don't pretend. I scythe all. Sean stated firmly. She stammered. That's... you're lying. How could you see anything while you were not here? Sean calmly explained. Mom, do you know about remote meetings? At that time, Emily and I were on a video call on the internet, so I saw everything. His words made her realize that I had been working from home. Although the concept of remote work had been mentioned on the news, it appeared she hadn't understood it at all. Always engrossed in soap operas from morning to evening, she paid little attention to other matters and was unfamiliar with modern technology. Still in disbelief, she retorted. Stop lying and blaming me. Sean responded quietly but with conviction. There's proof. My attention was captured by an item he took out of his bag. It was a photo, an A4 sized printed out screenshot capturing the moment that I was mercilessly doused with tea, drenched, and frozen in front of my computer screen. He began to explain the situation. Actually, my company has been short-staffed recently, and we've been asking for help from Emily's company. So I was also participating in today's meeting remotely from the hotel. 
Then suddenly I saw Emily drenched on the screen. I was honestly shocked. I never imagined such a thing could happen in our own home. Smiling at my husband's words, and I replied lightly. Huh, sorry, I didn't mean to worry you. I felt grateful for my husband's understanding and support even in such a situation. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law, holding the photo showing the undeniable evidence, stood frozen with a look of shock. Sean pressed further. Hey, if you're feeling better, it might be time to go back to your own house. From this video, it looks like you're throwing tea with the right hand that was supposed to be injured. I recalled the incident. My mother-in-law, supposedly injured, had thrown the tea with her right hand. The video was irrefutable proof of that moment. She began to make excuses in a fluster. No, that was. I just wanted to teach her a lesson. I had no idea she was working. I immediately responded firmly to her unjust claim. I explained it to you in advance. If you didn't listen, that's your problem. And throwing tea as guidance is just unreasonable, no matter how you look at it. Ignoring my mother-in-law's reaction, I strongly asserted my justification. She looked at me as if wanting to say something, but I remained undaunted by her gaze. Sean delved deeper into the situation, offering crucial information. I heard from my brother recently, Mom. Were you really telling my sister-in-law who just gave birth that she should have more kids as a stay-at-home mom and that you'd take care of the kids if she was struggling? You were saying that every day on the phone. Sean's words made her shoulders tremble with surprise and fear. This was completely new information for me as well. He pressed further. Is it true that my sister-in-law was almost driven to a nervous breakdown and my brother declared a break in relation with you because of it? This was completely new information for me as well. Sean pressed further, the mother-in-law stuttered, unable to find the words. I, I mean. And about the injury the day after, was that really an accident? Or did you do it to yourself? As he asked these direct questions, she averted her eyes, seeming to hide something. Convinced, Sean forcefully grabbed her supposedly injured wrist. Panicked, she cried out. Wait, wait. But Sean calmly demanded. Answer me. Finally, she confessed. Actually, it was just a sprain. I thought about jumping from the second floor, but got scared and ended up stopping myself, which resulted in the sprain. But I really did get hurt. The excuses left both Sean and me deeply disappointed, exhaling deep sighs. She, expressing his dissatisfaction with her excuses, highlighted the problem with her actions. It's not just about whether the injury is real. Clearly, you wanted to live with my brother and his family, but faking an injury to gain sympathy and help is just causing trouble. I joined in. Moreover, your actions have now damaged my computer. This goes beyond mere nuisance, and it's causing real harm. Shocked, Sean exclaimed. Really? At my words, both my husband and my mother-in-law showed expressions of astonishment. Confused, Sean asked. Did the computer really break? I explained in detail. The keyboard and speakers are gone, and the monitor is acting up. If I turn off the power now, it probably won't start up again. Incredulous, Sean murmured. Really? And slumped down, overwhelmed. That's the computer I also use. He said indignantly to his mother. In a panic, she suggested. Then you can just buy a new one. With a wry smile, I responded. Mother, do you know how much a computer costs? She looked at me bewildered and replied. Huh. I emphasized to her. Please don't say just buy a new one so easily. You're the one who broke the computer, so can you compensate for it? With a forced smile, she said. Taking money from an old lady, that's harsh, Emily. Ha ha. Showing a troubled expression. I sighed inwardly, accepting the situation as it was. Sean, still angry, said to his mother. It's not harsh. I'm just stating the facts. You've been living here for almost a month without contributing a single penny, so at least pay the living expenses before you leave. I agreed with him. Exactly. The frozen food was thrown away without permission, and now a valuable computer is broken. Shocked, Sean added. You did all that? Unbelievable. She doesn't understand how hard we work to earn our money. His anger apparent, he continued. No, it's not enough. 
She doesn't realize how much we pay in insurance and manage with our take-home pay. Yet, she lives here like a guest without doing anything. Sean's criticism continued unabated. If you were really injured and in trouble, I wouldn't say this, but it seems like nothing but laziness and sulking. Why should I support you when even I can't support my wife with my salary, either work properly or live on dad's pension? You rely on the kids every day and tell Emily to stop working. But who do you think is paying for your food? Her salary covers the food expenses. I heard that you almost caused my brother and my sister-in-law to divorce. You're like a plague bringing disaster to the house. Please stop. Overwhelmed by Sean's harsh words, she began to tear up and eventually started crying loudly. Face down on the floor, she whispered. I'm really sorry. But Sean showed no sympathy for her attitude, critically stating. Crying and trying to get away with it is useless. This is typical of someone who has never worked. Normally people apologize properly and take responsibility for their actions, not just cry about it. Seeing my mother-in-law making the floor dirty with her tears and her runny nose, I felt a bit of sympathy and gently said. Give her a break, please. My mother-in-law murmured faintly. I'll leave. I'll pay for the computer. Please forgive me. Sean, however, responded with a determined attitude. No, I can't take it anymore. I won't involve myself with you any longer. It's one thing for me, but I can't forgive you for troubling Emily. Considering what happened with my sister-in-law, I can't let Emily be put in the same situation. My mother-in-law, still crying, pleaded. Please. I don't want to be hated by you and your brother. Sean stated more firmly. That's a consequence you brought on yourself. Not just the incident with my sister-in-law, but your outdated views that women's happiness lies in childbirth and men are worthless if they don't turn. These ideas don't hold up anymore. Emily and I have decided to support each other and live our lives. There's no need to overextend ourselves. That's why everyone dislikes your interference. But in my time, she began, but Sean interrupted her forcefully. That's the problem. Your time was your time, but we are living in the present. Don't cling to old ideas and try to hold us back. If we want children, we'll have them. If not, that's okay. As long as we're happy together as a couple, that's enough. I listened carefully to him while also watching my mother-in-law's reaction. She appeared surprised and confused as if a new world had opened up to her. For her, who had believed in the sole validity of her era's values, Sean's assertion that we are living in the present was undoubtedly an unexpected turn. Sean said to his mother in a tone that seemed to be a final decision. This is really the last time. I have a lot to say, but we don't need your contribution to the living expenses, including the cost of the computer. So, please leave. As a working couple, we don't need to be swayed by your adherence to past values. We will prove in this house that we can live well on our own. She muttered as if in disbelief. Such a thing. Even after receiving Sean's final notice, she couldn't move for a while. But, eventually, she decided to leave the house, gathering her things, influenced by Sean's words that her prolonged stay only increased their aversion. She left carrying her luggage with her injured hand. After that, we thought we were in a state of de facto estrangement. However, at the end of the year, we received a message from her asking us to visit for the holidays. Family ties persist, but estrangement within a family living in the same state is not easy. Nevertheless, we decided to decline the visit, citing the risk of COVID-19 infection. Regardless of how the pandemic situation changes, being afraid of COVID remains our stance for not visiting. In fact, because of COVID has become a convenient justification to avoid troublesome gatherings and visits. Regarding my pregnancy, we have not informed her at all. Following my husband's policy, we plan to quietly welcome the birth without telling her anything. I felt a bit anxious when the doctor told me the baby was a girl. Her main concern was the possibility of my mother-in-law imposing outdated values on me. If she reflected on her past views and showed a change of heart, there might be a chance to reconsider our family relationship. However, considering recent events, that possibility seemed slim, especially recalling a Christmas card from her, which read, it's best to have children before your mid-thirties, reflecting her outdated beliefs. This further strengthened my resolve. I decided not to send a Christmas card to her anymore even if one arrived from her, 
Sean and I felt there was some self-inflicted aspect to my mother-in-law's actions and looked forward to the arrival of our new family member with genuine anticipation. Recently, with remote work becoming the norm, Sean wanted to create something special for our baby and was diligently knitting baby socks. He was dreaming of the day when he could proudly tell his child, Daddy made these for you. Not to be outdone, I was knitting a wool hat to match the socks, but since I followed Sean's chosen design, it ended up being in red and white stripes. Next, Sean started knitting a cape, also in red and white stripes. At this rate, the baby might end up dressed like Wally from Where's Wally? I looked forward to the day when our child would say, Mom has better taste, and he would be slightly envious. For me, such small competitions were part of the fun memories we would create with our new family member. <laughs>